You're listening to the Maritime Gardening Podcast, episode 112, brought to you by Vessi Seeds and Safer's Gardening Product. Well, today, folks, we're going to talk about growing vegetables in pots. I get a lot of questions about this from my viewers, and I don't really do it other than a geranium on my front porch and a, a you know a perennial a herb plant on my back porch. I'm not really good at this, so I've brought in local gardening celebrity, uh, Nikki Jabor, who's been doing this a lot longer than me. Um, so who is Nikki Jabor? She is uh, an award-winning and best-selling author of four books, including The Year-Round Vegetable Gardener and Growing Undercover, uh, two-time winner of the American uh, prestigious American Horticultural Society Book Award, uh, creator and longtime host of local radio show here. That's how I know about her uh, initially. Uh, anyway, uh, The Weekend Gardener. It's uh, on um, 95.7 FM in Halifax and 1310 uh, News in Ottawa. Uh, was that, it's on, is that a, it's a Sunday? Yeah, yeah, that's right, Sunday. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and you can listen to past episodes, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, they have yeah. them on the radio station website. People can tune in and check out those conversations, including the one I had with you not that long ago. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, she also writes for uh, newspapers and magazines, including Fine Gardening, Birds and Blooms, and Horticulture, speaks at events uh, across the country, across North America. And she's a co-owner of the popular website, Savvy Gardening, and she can be found on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. So, Nikki, say hello. <laughs> hello, Greg. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to chat with you again. <laughs> this is great. This is great. So, uh, tell uh, just before we get started. So, Nikki's going to talk about everything we could think of that almost like the top ten thing you top ten things you you'd want to know if you're getting interested in growing vegetables in pots for people that either are gardening on a deck or they just don't have much of a backyard or they just don't want to do it that way and they want to do it on pots for whatever reason. Um, but, you know, before we get into that, just tell us a little bit, uh, aside from what I've said, um, you know, tell us about you've, you've got a nice garden in your backyard. So, and how did, how did you get into this whole, I, I'm, I'm curious to know, how did you get into all of this? Well, I mean, I've been a gardener pretty much all my life. So I really got into food gardening when I was young. Um, my grandmothers were gardeners. My mother was a gardener. But um, when we always had a little, I'd like to say, unproductive vegetable garden when I was a kid like at the summer cottage you know it'd be beans couple tomato plants cucumbers but it was mainly wheat let's be honest I hope my mother's not listening um and but it still showed me that when you grow your own food it just tastes so much better and that was a lesson I learned when I was a kid and so with you know by the time I was probably 12 I had taken over that spot of growing vegetables and my mother showed me how to plant and fertilize and water um, and you know, it was my spot. And then I just expanded from there. By the time I was 16, I had grow lights. <laughs> I was starting a whole bunch of things indoors. Uh, and then I went off to Dal and did a degree in English and history. And then I realized, wait a minute, I can actually study horticulture. So I finished that degree and then went off and studied horticulture uh, and never looked back, honestly. So it's been pretty fun. And you're right, I do have a garden here in Halifax. Um, it's a sizable garden at this point. The main garden is 20 raised beds with tunnels and trellises and um, you know lots of different other things and ways I grow food. And then there's a 14 by 24 foot polytunnel with raised beds and fabric planters. Um, I added, you know, I think I told you when we talked on the radio show that I took out the rest of my backyard this year. No more weedy grass. So now I have pollinator plants. I'm putting in more berries and I put in six more raised beds for food gardening. So I've got a lot of vegetable beds, but yet I still couldn't fit everything I wanted to grow in the garden this year. So I think yep. we're a lot of like that way. <laughs> I think there's almost like a, I remember Martin Short, the comedian said that, um, that uh, uh, comedy is a disorder that people like. <laughs> um like it's a mental being a comedian is a mental disorder but people like it um yeah. and uh you know i always wonder like is because i have the same I pathologically i, I can't never grow everything <laughs> i want to grow i'm always making i'm always trying to like get more out of my space i always feel like i have too much and i always want more um yeah, and uh, but it's that. it's like a it's a it's a it's like a disorder but it, it's beneficial <laughs> yeah and one of my favorite ways to sneak more food into my garden instead of building another bed or you know filling up containers um you know the old potting mix from your old containers i yes. mix that with the old straw mulch from the year before and these big piles at the end of my garden so it's this big mixture of organic materials and then i plant all my squash in there cucumbers edible gourds and i just let them do their thing i put some organic like uh organic vegetable fertilizer in there too. And they just take over that whole end of the garden. So it's like a, a no work bed that pays off big time. So I'm always trying to find more ways to sneak food into my garden. It's, it's like, that's a good, I, I have a similar kind of thing. It's like a big perpetually composting mess. 
yes. that you grow, <laughs> you grow this huge leafy thing in that, that smothers out any potential weeds. So it, it's, and it's got all the, you know, it's a heavy feeder. So it's getting, unfortunately with mine, it's like yeah. underneath a maple tree, but it's oh. still, <laughs> it's still so productive. It still grows. I could, you know, I've gotten like, awesome. you know, pumpkins this big out of there. Right. So uh, nice. but it's yeah. not, not optimal in terms of sun, but um, yeah. So, yeah. so you have some, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to guess you've got more potted plants in, in various forms than I do, because I really don't have any. Yeah, I, I do. I grow a lot of things in pots too, even though, again, I have a big garden space and raised beds. Um, my back deck is incredibly sunny. Uh, and last year during the pandemic, look, right before it actually, we, we had taken out our old deck and built a new one. The right time for lumber prices, let me tell you, we lucked into that. Um, but we doubled the size of the deck. So I like growing herbs and some vegetables right on my deck because it's outside my kitchen door. So, exactly. you know, when I'm cooking and I need basil or parsley, which is pretty much every day, I can run out and grab a handful of what I need. And I also have some cherry tomatoes there and some hot peppers and some, just some of the vegetables um, that grow really well in containers. So I've got some of those on my deck. Plus I love mixing flowers and vegetables together in containers. You know, they look great together. So why just grow petunias when you can plant petunias and maybe some lemongrass um, or some basil in there and a pepper, you know, it looks all great together. It's ornamental and then you've got some food plants. So I also have some food plants outside my greenhouse. I grow like alpine strawberries and planters and peppers and tomatoes and things in pots. Um, in my polytunnel, the whole middle, like so I have two permanent raised beds on either side and the whole middle is fabric bags. And I'm sure you've seen these fabric bag planters you can buy. So these are long beds and they're eight feet long. So that's 16 feet of growing space. And they, for that, I just use vertical crops like the tomatoes that grow eight or nine feet tall, right to the center of the greenhouse, melons, cucumbers, things like that. Um, so yeah, I plant in a lot of different types of containers and a lot of different types of spaces. So. Yeah, let, let's get into it. I, we got so much we can share, I think. But just before we start, I forgot to mention at the beginning because I didn't have it in my notes. Uh, Nikki also has a YouTube channel. So what, what's the name of the YouTube channel? Nikki Jabor. Nikki Jabor, okay, that's pretty easy. So just Google pretty Nikki Jabor. Yeah, just yeah. Google Nikki Jabor and you'll you'll find you so they can see your garden and some of the things you're talking about here. It's a very, oh, um, yeah. looks uh, looks different from mine, similar in some ways, different in other ways. I, it looks more organized. Um, <laughs> It doesn't always look super organized. I, know, I, mean, I, I, I post on Instagram a lot, as you know, but, you know, sometimes what you don't see between the beds are the row covers that are pulled down between the beds because, you know, I yes. had them on the night before or things like that. But, you know, I also like to show when things go wrong or when things are messy yes. in the garden. So people know a garden is a work in progress. It's never oh, yeah. finished. And when you think it looks perfect, the next day it changes. So it's I a know. garden, right? I got, I've got one bed of beets, four by eight. And um, normally I put something between the rows to keep the weeds down, like cardboard or something. This one I yeah. didn't. And I've, I haven't weeded it because I want to make a video. It, it's looked, three weeks ago, it looked overwhelming to weed. And I thought, oh, I should make a video to show people it's not that big a deal. I can weed this whole thing in 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. oh, I still haven't weeded it. <laughs> now it's now, 40 minutes. <laughs> now the weeds are above the beets, right? They're, yeah. they're really, the weeds are now wrecking the garden sort of thing in a sense, because they're out competing the 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 beets so now it's a really i guess it'll make a better video <laughs> it's Vis really speaking, it will. <laughs> yeah. yeah and yeah. i like how you i mean you're always thinking about that too and i do a lot of videos in my garden as well so i mean it's just another aspect to think about like sometimes i'll let weeds go so that i can demonstrate um or you let your basil flower or you want to pinch things back just to show people how to do that so you know it doesn't always look perfect but you know what it's my garden and i love it so I'm exactly it's your garden it's your rules my yeah. house my rules <laughs> All right, so we yeah. got uh, yeah, we got a number of topics here, and uh, we got a we got a horticulturist, a master gardener here to uh, answer our questions. So let's take advantage of the time we have. Um, yeah. So first one is about starting with the right site. Yeah, this is like super important. So I mean, I, I know you've talked about it many times in videos and such. If you're growing food, most types of vegetables need lots of light, and that is really eight or more hours every single day. Um, and with less light, there's still some crops you can grow. You know, you can still grow things like leaf lettuce and spinach and parsley and beets and a lot of leafy things will still grow in less light. But if you want the peppers, the cucumbers, the zucchini, the tomatoes, you need lots of sunshine. And this applies to, you know, container gardening as well. So if you've got a shady balcony, don't try to grow tomatoes. You know, try to grow leafy vegetables, you know, grow what is going to do well in your site. Um, but if you can pick where you put your containers, put them in full sun, uh, it's really quite essential. I mean, ideally to an area with not too much wind, 
um, you know, and, and so things to think about, uh, you know, also somewhere where you can access water, right? So, you know, sun is important, but also watering, especially in containers is going to be key. So putting your containers where they can uh, use a hose nearby, or you don't have to haul a watering can a couple hundred yards to get there. So those are things I would think about when I'm thinking, where am I going to put these containers? Um, so yeah, sunshine, the number one, I think, defining point of success when growing food is plenty of light. Yeah, I think then, uh, you know, this is something I, I tend to rant about how people, they tend to view the positioning of their garden, the way they would view decorating a living room, right? Mm. Or, you know, and, and thinking of the plants or the pots as, as, as accessories and decorations and putting them where they think they'll have the best visual effect. Yeah. When in fact, it's the exact opposite. I might, there might be only one place you can grow certain plants on your deck because it gets the best sun. Mm -hmm. And I was going to ask you, what if someone, let's think about someone who's got an apartment and they're on a deck, but I never have to think this way, uh, but I, I, I don't know about you, but I spent years living in apartments. Mm -hmm. um, so let's say they're, they have a deck and it's got the sun, but it's very windy. Can you think yeah. of anything, someone like, you? let's say I want to grow a, a plant that, that is going to get beat, like some plants will get the, 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 like a basil will get beaten to pieces by wind. Totally. And it's pepper, and here, at least here in Nova Scotia, it can be hard to get peppers to grow because the air around the pepper isn't warm enough because they like so much heat with wind. Is there anything, aside from just choosing things that can take wind, um, yeah. uh, is there anything? Yeah, you put wind breaks, of wind course, break. you know, yes. you know, I mean, there's lots of different kinds of wind breaks you can get to attach to, um, uh, you know, the balcony, the railings, things like that, of course. Um, so, you know, sometimes they're more fabric based, um, sometimes they're more plastic. So different types of windbreaks would probably help a lot in that situation. Just make sure you're not choosing ones that are going to block light, <laughs> you yeah. know, so clear plastic might be better or even, um, you know, maybe elevating your planters up a little bit as well. There's so many different kinds of things like containers and vessels you can grow food in. Um, yeah. So being a little creative, Maybe, you know, that you can uh, mount some half window boxes or planters to the back of your balcony to the wall itself. Um, and maybe there'll be a, a little less in the wind at that point. So yeah. trying to see where the wind is. It's going to be obviously yeah. closest to the balcony edge. So trying to come back a little bit from that and putting in some wind breaks would be beneficial. Yeah, go out there with a pinwheel and see where it spins. <laughs> yeah, <the fastest>. exactly. <laughs> okay, so we got a yeah. uh, location now, a vessel, the pot. And uh, how, how yeah. do we pick the right pots? Oh my gosh. Well, I mean, the sky's the limit. You know, you can DIY containers, you can buy containers. Um, and when you think about upcycling or using DIY type containers, I mean, you could build wooden boxes, like wooden planters. Uh, you can you can take an old bucket and, and put some drainage holes in it and make that into a container. Um, you know, I, as I mentioned to you earlier, I have a, a coffee bean bag. Some of the coffee shops in, in the city here, you can get the bags for free. And so I remember last year with the pandemic too, and we didn't know, I couldn't find containers because we couldn't shop for a long time, but I was able to get coffee bean bags and I planted a whole bunch of crops in those and they did amazing. So I still grow um, in my coffee bean bags. Baskets, I mean, wire, you know, containers. There's so many options for taking old items and recycling them into containers. Uh, I think there's probably a million videos on YouTube on that as well. Um, also, of course, you can buy containers plastic, fiberglass, um, the fabric ones, like I mentioned uh, as well. So there's no shortage of those types of things to use. I love terracotta and I love the look of terracotta, but it's expensive. You have to store it over the winter because it'll break if you leave it out in the garden. Plus it dries out in like, I don't know, five seconds. So I don't want to water my containers 20 times a day. So um, if you had glazed terracotta, obviously that's going to be a bit better. Or you could plant in plastic and then hide it in a terracotta pot if you really want that terracotta look. Yeah, um, right. But, you know, Generally, I would use plastic pots. I tend to use for the most part. And then I'll upcycle a bunch of items too. Um, pretty much anything that will hold some soil, you can plant in. Um, I would think about size, of course, because the bigger a container is, the more soil it's going to hold and therefore it's gonna dry out you know, less quickly. So it's important, I think, to, to have as large a container as you can. Yes, you'll spend more money putting soil into it, but you'll also spend far less time watering it throughout the whole summer months. So I like to use larger containers if I can. Um, but even if you use like the, the white bucket sort of thing and you group four or five of them together, they're gonna kind of like, um, you know, they're not gonna dry out as quickly when they're all pushed together, you know, versus being totally spaced out where the heat and the sun and the wind can dry them out far faster. Um, yeah. so, you know, so, but containers, material, size, buy them, upcycle them, lots of options out there. Have you done any upcycling yourself when it comes to growing vegetables in containers? Not too much, because I only have two potted plants on the whole property. <laughs> I'll, two, I get two acres of two potted plants. Uh, right. so, so sometimes no. we'll have three. 
Um, but yeah, people ask me about it a lot. And since I grow everything in the ground and it grows so well, I say, try to trick the plant. The tr the, in my, yeah. my, my theory is that if you're going to grow things well in containers, you want to trick the plant into thinking it's in the ground. Um, yeah. you know, uh, so that's, uh, I, I, I was, it's funny. Um, you are mentioning recycling. I was, uh, I got a friend who lives in the Valley and, uh, he's got a buddy who lives on a river and, uh, I was in that guy's backyard. So it's just some guy who knows some guy. And they had, uh, you know, weed <laughs> oh, growing, yeah. growing in five gallon buckets. Yeah. And these things were like sunflowers. They were huge. Uh, wow. Just all, and these were just paint buckets. You know, it said like Glidden or whatever, you know. Like, yeah, yeah. Th those make great containers. You just got to water those religiously yeah. <laughs> and fertilize them. But, you know, you can also grow food in hanging baskets. And yes. I've experimented with this a lot. My problem with it is they dry out again in like 10 seconds. So right now in my greenhouse, I do have two different tomatoes in hanging baskets as well as strawberries. The strawberries do pretty well, I gotta say, but the tomatoes, oh my gosh, you know what happens if tomatoes dry out too. Um, there's so many problems they can get. So they dry out very quickly. So, right. you know, you buy a tomato plant at your garden center, you might spend 30 bucks in a big tomato in a hanging basket, and it's going to dry out really, really quickly. So you have to pay extra attention to watering if you're going to grow in hanging baskets or even small window boxes, because, you know, you go to the garden centers and there's these tiny six inch window boxes, really narrow, maybe by two feet long. That's a really tiny amount of space. Yes. I would maybe grow alpine strawberries or lettuce in there or spinach, but I'm not going to grow big tomato plants in that tiny space. So really think about the types of plants you're going to grow and how big they're going to get and match yeah. that to the size of the pot. Well, if you're upcycling, recycling something yeah. and it, does, it doesn't have holes in it, let's say I've got like a five gallon bucket. So that's about a 12 inch diameter by about 16 inches high, give or take. Yeah. Uh, how many, like how much hole per space? <laughs> do you know, like, you know, I just keep putting holes into a toy. Yeah. <laughs> My idea is if I put water in it, the water should come out and the water the state, you know, you, you don't want it a uh, pool in the bottom, but you know, is there anything people should think about when they're punching holes through something? Can you have yeah. too much, too much holes? You can have too many or you can make them too big. Like I wouldn't be drilling one inch holes in the bottom of my containers. Um, quarter inch holes are, are great. Um, and, you know, if I had one of those, like you say, paint buckets, that's maybe a foot across, I would probably put nine or 10 holes in the bottom of that at least. Um, yes. You know, that should be enough and, and, and put them in an even, you know, kind of like spread at the bottom of the container. Uh, I mean, it only takes, what, 10 seconds to do that. It's not, it doesn't take very long but yeah. it'll certainly pay off big time um, because you wanna make sure everything drains really well. The quickest way to kill a plant is bad drainage. And in yes. containers, that is often an issue, which is another problem with choosing something like terracotta. Um, oftentimes they don't have drainage holes and you might love that pot, but it is not gonna do well for plants. Um, yes. And even if you buy a plastic pot or a window box or a planter sometimes, it doesn't have holes in the bottom. So again, yeah. add them if you can, because otherwise you're just gonna slowly be torturing and killing that plant. <laughs> Well, As I've learned over the years. Speaking of uh, keeping plants alive, uh, <laughs> what about potting mix and soil? Soil, like how do we, yeah. you know, um, can we just dig up, can I take soil out of my garden, put it in a flower pot? Is there a particular potting mix I should have? Is there an ideal, I mean, there's, there's rules for ideal soil for a garden. And as uh, mm -hmm. Robert Pavlos just told me the other day, there's an ideal soil and nobody has it. Uh, but, but for, I guess for the potting in a, in a pot, sort of, you are, you are a God, you're, you're the God of that little yeah. universe, that little planet. Um, so yeah. What, what do you want to stick in there in terms of soil? Well, I know we've, we've been saying soil. I've been saying soil the whole time so far, but yeah, I don't use soil in my containers actually. Um, you can't take garden soil of your garden and put it in a container. I mean, every time you water, it just gets compacted and compacted further down and you've got no air spaces left in that soil. Uh, it's not light and fluffy anymore. It's not free draining. Um, it's going to smother your plants. So unfortunately, oh. garden soil does not work in containers. You need right. to get a potting mix, lightweight potting mix. And most of them are going to be made from materials like peat moss, um, vermiculite, perlite. There's probably going to be some fertilizers in there. But you know, that's basically what's in an all-purpose potting mix. Um, it's pretty it's expensive, <laughs> but that's really all that it is. Now, the issue is um, peat is not all really that environmentally friendly or renewable, you know? So that's a big conversation right now in the UK, and it's certainly coming here as well. And we're going to see that happening in the next couple of years. Um, should we be taking peat from our peat bogs for gardening? You know, that's going to be a big conversation. Um, now, another option people are using for potting mixes, because you can DIY your own potting mix as well as buy them is coconut core. Also not really very renewable, nor is it, is it environmentally friendly because it travels so far to get to us, you know, here in the Northern atmosphere or hemisphere. So, yeah. um, 
you know, we don't have a great, you know, um, product to sub in there. Compost, I'm actually experimenting with compost, potting mixes I've been mixing up this spring to see how they do. So I'm growing things in compost uh, mixed with vermiculite and perlite and some other materials. We'll see, but I think we're gonna have to have a, a total, uh, you know, change coming to the potting mix industry in the coming years. And uh, yeah, it's not far away, it's, it's almost here. One thing I do out of cheapness, so my wife always wants a geranium on the front step <laughs> once it gets warm, always. I can't go yeah. around. I can't talk her out of it. Uh, it's not <laughs> the best. That's okay. I know. I always want something that's, that's just, it's not the sunniest spot. So I always want something that's got colorful leaves, right? Yeah. Um, but anyway, you can't, you know, you can't win. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so out of cheapness, one thing I'll do with the pot is almost copy a trick I use in my garden where I, I bury rotten wood. And so let's right. say I've got a pot that's uh, 12 inches high. I make the bottom four inches just, you know, rotten wood that I found in the backyard and just take up the space because the plant roots aren't going all the way down or if they are, um, yeah. you know, I mean, there's, there's a lot of space in that, but it's a large pot. There's a lot of space. And some pots are very upright. Like one of the big trends is these like three foot tall pots. And yeah, you're right. Like I usually fill the bottom half with like old containers or something, you know, yeah, so you don't... Yeah spend a fortune on potting mix. Now, the other option actually for potting mix that I'm experimenting with is also leaf mold. So leaf composting mold, yeah. leaves and then mixing that with other compost and vermiculite and perlite and things to see if I can create a potting mix that's going to work for my plants. Um, yeah. So we've got some options for the future, but for now, most potting mixes you would use are going to be peat-based across okay. Canada. Yeah. All right. And uh, I don't think it's, oh yeah, it's one of our topics here, so we'll get to it. Um, so We've got the location, we've got the container, we've got the mix. Now, uh, in terms of vegetables, what uh, what do we want to think about growing in pots? So it's not, I'm, I'm imagine not everything can be grown. I, I guess if you think about any, a pot can be any size conceivably, you could grow anything in a pot. But let's, if yeah. we're thinking about, you know, one foot high, one foot wide, what most people can pick up and move around and manage. Uh, what, what are we talking about growing in pots in terms of vegetables? Yeah, I mean, I've seen pots grown in everything and I've seen every type of vegetable or vegetables grown in every type of pot. And and, and you, you certainly can grow anything you want. Um, another, another popular item to upcycle are those Rubbermaid containers, you know, the big, yes. they, like almost three feet by two feet, putting a bunch of holes in the bottom of those. You can even DIY them into self-watering containers, which is great with like a water reservoir on the bottom. And you can yeah. plant more tomato plants in there. I've seen people grow corn in that. Um, I mean, giant That's a great pumpkins. idea. Mm. Right. So if the container is the right size, you can grow anything, um, you know, but that's up to you, I guess, and how much space you have. And like you said, if you want to move it around, once my containers are filled, I don't move them around. They're on the deck until the end of the season. They're in front of my greenhouse. Uh, I'm certainly can't move my fabric beds in the greenhouse around. They weigh about 400 pounds each at this point. Oh. Um, so, yeah, they're there until the end of the season. But so, again, I would like to think people use a bigger size container. Um, but then, you know, you can grow so many different kinds of, of vegetables, whatever you like to eat. That's what I tell people, grow what you like to eat. So if you like cucumbers, grow cucumbers. But of course, thanks to plant breeders, um, we have so many new varieties and cultivars that have been int introduced the past decade or so um, that are pot friendly, you know, for growing in containers. Cucumbers that only grow, you know, two feet tall that you can put in a tomato cage in the container. Tomatoes that grow, oh my gosh, eight or nine inches tall. I've got micro tom tomatoes growing. Um, you know, I've got red robin. These guys only get this big, but they'll still produce a couple dozen tomatoes. Um, oh. You know, you can get tumbling tom tomato, which is just like a hanging basket tomato, maybe 10 or 12 inches. And that'll still produce probably 60 tomatoes over the course of the summer or more. Um, there's peppers that are very compact. So zucchini that are bred for container growing. Really? So I would say read your seed catalogs carefully. Read the labels when you go to the garden center carefully and pick out varieties meant to be grown in containers or planters. Sometimes it will say like bush tomato or bush cucumber, um, or I'll say patio or dwarf. So read the labels and some of those buzzwords will tell you that it's meant to be grown in a container. But again, as long as the container is big enough, go crazy. So someone on Facebook asked me a question a couple of days ago about uh, one of the tomatoes they were growing in their garden and they sent pictures and they were just this little mounds of tomatoes. And they were just kind of like, she goes, I don't know why they're growing downwards. It's this tomato, I want it to get pretty big. And, but it was a tumbling tom tomato. So right. that's how it grows. It's a dwarf cascading tomato variety. So um, I would say just make sure when you're reading labels, you pick the right tomato and either grow it in a garden bed or a container, uh, depending on what type of tomato it is. Yeah, you don't you don't want to, what's that called? Um, undeterminate or what's that? What's that? Yeah, term? indeterminate or determinate. Yeah, you yeah. don't want so determinate tomatoes. Yeah, determinate <laughs> go about maybe four feet tall, some are three feet tall. Um, and then they'll produce their fruits pretty much all over like 
a similar time frame, so you can harvest, which is great for canning or making sauces. But indeterminate tomatoes or vining tomatoes, whoop, they go tall, seven feet tall or bigger sometimes. Um, and they'll produce so over a, you know a longer period of time. So I mean, I grow both, but if you're growing in a container, probably determinant are the ones you want to grow. Well, speaking of which, uh, if I if I am growing something that's going to grow high or grow you know a vine or whatever. Uh, what are my options for, um, you know, trellising and supporting climbing plants when I'm growing in pots? Yeah, because I mean, so many types of vegetables climb and there's a lot of benefits for growing vining vegetables. You know, um, you can fit more food in less space by growing them up instead of out over a garden bed or containers. Um, you know, they'll have fewer insect disease problems when grown vertically. There's better air circulation. And, you know, for many things, it's easier to pick, um, you know, when things are growing up, cucumbers, melons, things like that. Um, you know, so there's a lot of benefits to growing things vertically. So uh, I plant in containers at the base of trellises, at the base of some of my bean tunnels. Uh, at, at if you have a fence, you can use. You can also use bamboo posts or something to create like a little uh, little structure, like a, a inside the in the container. You can buy contain you know container trellises and structures. You can use tomato cages to grow things vertically in containers. You can use just a single stake if you're growing just one tall type of tomato, and then tie it as it grows up, sort of thing. So there's many options for growing vertically. You can buy bean and pea netting, things like that too. So yeah, you can DIY with strings. I mean, in my greenhouse, the whole center is basically twine and all the tomatoes and cucumbers and melons are grown vertically on twine. You mean that it's hanging from the ceiling? Yeah, because the greenhouse, oh, cool. um, it's, it's 14 feet wide. So it's got trusses at the top, steel <laughs> trusses. And I have wires run down the trusses. So I just tie the strings to that. And they just grow vertically on those. That's really cool. I guess also if you're on a deck and it had like a railing, you could, you know, strategically position things so the railing becomes like yeah. a trellis. And or if you had a pergola, yeah, you know, yeah. something like pergola. that. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, get yeah. your beans, get your beans growing yeah. up there. Get something amazing looking. Um, so, watering. How do <laughs> I, how do how often do I water? How you know, too much, too yeah. little, that sort of thing. I think if there's one thing you need to know about caring for container crops, it's watering. And you don't want to get this wrong. Uh, consistent, deep watering is essential to the health of your container crops, especially crops like tomatoes and peppers, which are, which are prone to things like blossom end rot, which is a physiological condition that happens. Like it, the, the, the fruits will form these leathery, kind of brownish, black, grayish patches in the bottom of the fruits doesn't look appealing or appetizing. Um, and really it takes away from the eating quality of the fruit. So you don't want that to happen, but that happens. It's not a disease. It's not caused by a pest. Um, it's caused by inconsistent watering. Um, the plants need calcium to grow and produce those fruits. And if what, and, and the calcium is basically pushed off the plants and through the tips and into the flowers and the fruits through water. But if you're not watering consistently, that water is not getting all the way into the plant like it should. Um, and if, especially if you let your tomatoes or your peppers wilt, in the summer sun, if they get to the point of wilting, damage has already occurred. So you wanna make sure you water so that they don't wilt at all, which probably means watering every day. You know, uh, it, weather like we're having right now, which has been kind of wet, maybe every two days on really hot summer days, maybe in the morning and in the evening, you might have to water twice. I do also mulch around my tomato uh, in containers, my tomato plants, because that helps hold the soil moisture and reduces the risk of, of wilting. So consistent watering is key. Don't water lightly. Water so deeply that the water comes out the bottom of the pot, um, I think is really important. If it's a fabric pot that doesn't have drainage holes, it'll still weep out the bottom. Don't worry about that. But water deeply, water consistently, mulch if you can. Um, and yeah, that's the most important thing to remember. Oh, so I was going to ask you, because yeah, I, I mulch with vine because I mulch everything. It make, makes sense on the ground. So it makes sense with that. And it's, yeah. it's good that you point out, uh, you go on any um, Facebook garden group and someone will show a picture of blossom and rot tomato and said what is this and what do i do and everybody said they'll either say put ca calcium tablets in the ground or, or epsom salts or epsom salts <laughs> let's add salt let's add salt to this equation um, yeah no no yeah eggshells aren't going to do it like people oh. will tell you crush up eggshells put it in your containers that's the calcium sure does but it's not going to get to your plants anytime oh, soon maybe in a thousand years yeah. you know uh, and your soil uh, is generally not calcium deficient so it's not that oh. you're calcium deficient it's the watering um, and when you do water too, like, and I'm sure you do this, Greg, in your garden beds as well, water the soil. Like I'm not yeah. standing there spraying the top of my tomato plants, letting the water run down. Um, that can spread disease. So I water the soil, not the plant. Yeah, since I've got you on, on here, and this is a general gardening question, um, 
if I have a, so sometimes I'll grow my tomatoes directly in the ground, so direct seed them and everything in, in like, you know, sort of temporary cold frame type deal. Yeah. Um, this year I, I bought seeds to do that, but I just kept putting it off and putting it off and now it's June. So I just went and bought some at uh, Bloom actually. Oh, um, nice. It's a great place, you know. I love um, it. Don't, don't get me started with Bloom. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So um, anyway, um, when I stuck all my tomatoes in the ground, I just, just this year, I said, I, I picked off all the, the, um, the blossoms because mm -hmm. I thought those blossoms probably form when the, it's, it's, it's unlikely that a plant that's a foot and a half tall, that's in, in like a, you know, a coffee mug's worth of soil is probably getting the calcium that's needed to those, you know, it's, it's unlikely unless they're supplementing it. So I figured yeah. those blossoms are probably no good anyway. So I just picked them all off. Um, is that a good idea when you're, when you're planting out a transplant? That's yeah, flower, I mean, ideally, in the pot. I try to grow my tomato transplants. I start most of my own. I do buy some, of course, because I happen upon varieties I'm not growing, and then I'm like, ooh. Um, yeah. But I try to buy ones that don't have flowers on them already. Doesn't always happen. Um, so if that, in that case, I would pick off those flowers. Yeah. Um, and, but I mean, garden centers fertilize almost every day. <laughs> Pretty much every time they water, there's a little bit of fertilizer in there going to those plants. So it's probably okay, blossom end uh, wise, as long as they haven't been allowed to wilt, which if it's at a big box store, they probably have. Um, but at independent garden centers, usually they're pay attention, of course, to watering really, really well. So that should be fine. But yeah, I do pick off the, the blossoms before I'd plant them. And I also pick off the bottom leaves and I plant the plants yeah. deeply, right? I know you do as well, but I plant them as, you know, at least half the stem, if not two thirds of the stem gets buried. And that just helps produce a more robust root system, whether in a container or a garden bed. Yes. Well, speaking of roots and nutrients and such, uh, fertilizing, uh, yeah. what, you know, I'm sure this is probably the one, th I mean, there's probably two ways people kill their, their potted plants. <laughs> they water it too much, they don't water it enough, or they f fertilize it too much. Probably fertilize it too much more than not enough. Um, yeah, yeah. So uh, sure. yeah, let's, uh, let's talk about that a little bit. What, I mean, so you've got your potting soil, often it has some sort of flow, yeah. slow release fertilizer in it. Um, so when do you start supplementing, um, the fertilizer that's actually in the potting medium and, and to what extent? Well, I probably should have mentioned this early on, but usually when I'm growing vegetables in containers, I mix the potting mix with compost too. So it's like, you know, two third uh, potting mix, one third compost. So I should have said that earlier. Um, so my soil already has some organic matter with nutrients in there because I've got that compost going. And then I usually add a slow release organic vegetable fertilizer in there too. Um, something that'll break down slowly over the coming months. Every time you water, release a little bit of nutrients. So um, that kind of sets you up right. So that's what I do to begin with my containers. And then during the growing season, every couple of weeks, probably every three weeks or whenever I remember, um, I will get out my liquid fish seaweed fertilizer, add a bit to a watering can, and, and I will water that into the soil as well. So I try to fertilize every couple of weeks um, just to give things a boost in containers, because unlike in-ground gardens and plants, they don't have the option of mining for nutrients. So I like to give them that little bit of fish and seaweed fertilizer or something, you know, a liquid quick shot uh, to help give them that little, uh, that little quick fix and help them grow. Because once your plants are growing your vegetable plants, you want them to keep growing steadily. You don't want them to all of a sudden, um, you know, be starving for nutrients and kind of slow their growth. You want them to keep growing consistently and quickly so they can put out fresh growth uh, and produce a really nice harvest. I would recommend using a liquid fertilizer to supplement um, at least up until probably mid-August, a couple of weeks, right. at least maybe a month before your frost date, and that'll help keep things going all season long. All right, that all makes sense because you're in the in the pot, you're 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 mimicking the soil condition. The soil condition it has organisms that are breaking down organic matter, and yeah. you know nutrients are constantly being released into the soil, and your plants can take it up. And in the in the pot, you haven't really got that happening to anyway, at least to the same extent. Um, mm -hmm. So your supplement. So just to speak to that, I mean, so you said you're you're fertilizing, but my guess is that you're putting a fairly weak amount of fertilizer, like just a little bit, and it's, it's always being added, but not like, not a huge treatment. You're, you're just putting a yeah. little. Yeah. So yeah, generally, I mean, it depends on the product and there's so many products, so I can't yes. recommend an application rate, obviously, uh, but often I will dilute it by half, you know, right. so if it's like add one tablespoon per gallon, then I will go what half of that um, yes. And that way I know I'm not overfeeding, but I'm still giving them that nice little boost of fertilizer. Um, and, and then sometimes for things like long-term vegetables, like tomatoes that are in the garden for so long, I will do a foliar spray of just like liquid kelp. Um, you know, we have Sea Boost here in Nova Scotia, which is a great product, a seaweed product. And 
you know, I spray that on, um, you know, the, the, the leaves and within a day or two, they just turn deeper green. It's amazing to see the difference and you literally can visually see the difference. Um, and that's always good because, you know, kelp, liquid kelp seaweed fertilizers are really high in micronutrients and plant hormones. Um, so I always think they're a great thing to apply to things like tomato plants, but too much can, you know, too often can be too much. So I don't usually do like a, a foliar of liquid kelp more than say every four to six weeks. More than that, it can actually uh, be a growth retardant and slow down the growth of plants. So um, follow directions on the package, read before you apply them to your plants for sure. I've never used that stuff. I should look at Oh, really? It. Yeah, no, oh, I'm, I'm unbelievably unproactive in my garden. So uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, neat yeah. thing to do an experiment where you do half of them with it and half of them without. And then yeah. You can see, like, look you at those totally ones. You can see the difference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that sounds really yeah. cool. Get some sea boost and see what happens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll think I'll look into that. Yeah, I'm gonna actually I'll write this down. Write that down. <laughs> um, so, uh, so it's fertilizing now. Yes. Harvesting. How do we? You know, is it is it any different than when you're gardening in the ground, or what? What considerations do you have to think about when you're growing in a pot? Yeah, I don't think it's any different necessarily when gardening when growing in the ground. Um, I think when you're growing your own vegetables, you know, you want to harvest them when they've reached peak quality which is often um, for things like salad greens or carrots or beets when they're slightly immature. Um, for tomatoes or peppers, you want them generally when they're fully ripe. Uh, but you know, for the most part, it's, it's going to be very similar. Um, you, know, you can also grow potatoes in containers as well. Uh, and you know, a cue that they might be ready to harvest baby potatoes is that the plants have just finished flowering. So you can start to pull out a few little nuggets from there or harvest them all as baby potatoes. Um, or you know, if you're growing potatoes and you want larger ones in containers, then just wait until the plants have died back in, you know, after a, a frost uh, in, in early autumn, mid autumn, and then you can harvest, dump that container out and harvest from that. Um, but I would just pay attention. You know, I, we love working in our gardens. I love being out there. So I'm always looking, is this tomato almost ready? Oh, this cucumber is gonna be ready to pick in a couple of days. And I just kind of make a note of that. And then I'll go out there and harvest when they're at the right quality. You don't want things to go too long. I find sometimes, you know, uh, you know, I get concerned about just, you know, I want the garden to look good, you know, for my work, for example, but you don't want to leave things in the ground too long. If you want to eat them, you want them to pick them when they're packed full of nutrients, when they're absolutely delicious. So um, I always try to harvest right when things are at that peak of quality. Well, there's something to be said for, you know, having something on a deck really close to your, your house or your apartment, You're, you can micromanage yeah. the plant, you know, like my, my stuff in my garden, I, I don't look at everything every day. But if right. you had, had something right outside your window, you'd see it every day. So you'd be uh, keen to little changes that are happening. And you could, uh, especially you could, you could pick it at just the right moment. Um, exactly. You know. And you can monitor for pests and diseases that way too. Yeah, I mean, if it's, yeah. if it's close at hand, you can see, oh, if there's aphids on my peppers. Maybe I yeah. should spray those off with a bit of water. Um, yeah. You know, just to, to keep an eye on things. It's, it's, it's a good way to do it too when you're growing in containers. Yeah, well, and, and speaking of harvesting, um, what about succession planting? Yeah, I mean, I, succession planting is something I think people generally do in garden beds. And I certainly succession plant all the time, but I also have succession planting containers. So, you know, early on in the season, I had in my greenhouse, I had lettuces growing in February in containers and, and March. Um, but as soon as those are done, I pull them out. You know, I'll, I'll add a bit more compost to the soil, a little more organic fertilizer and plant in that pot again. Um, you know, maybe I'll be planting something, you know, like tomatoes or peppers in the greenhouse so that I'll have those to get an early start. Um, and then at the end of the season, you can pull those out and plant something else, more greens again for fall or winter harvesting. Um, but if, even if you're growing on a deck, you can plant bush beans, say every month, a new pot of bush beans. So you'll have a continual harvest of bush beans. You can plant lettuce, you know, again, every three or four weeks, you'll have a continual harvest of lettuce. So, you know, you maybe pot up a, a container, a window box of leaf lettuce or spinach. A month later, three weeks later, plant up another one. So you'll always have some at peak quality to harvest from. If you wait until, you know, your lettuce is ready and done and then you pull it out and plant more, well, you've got a big empty space of time when you don't have anything to eat. So if you continue, continuously sow little bits, you'll have lots of vegetables to eat throughout the entire growing season. Even if you're growing in containers, it's a great way to do that. But well, it makes me think, you know, you really do with, with container gardening. I mean, there's, there's pros and cons, of course, but yeah. you do you do get to play god more so than you would <laughs> like in a garden you're very like you're, you're much more passive you, you sort of has to everything has to be where it has to be and the, the garden makes all the makes all the rules and you're just sort of you know understanding the garden and and 
you know, putting things where they're going to do well in the garden and working with yeah. you. It's a negotiation. Um, yeah. but, with, <laughs> but you don't uh, always win. <laughs> yeah, but it's, with, the, with the plants like, okay, this soil is now here. It's getting this much water. It's getting this much sun. And this is growing in it right now. Now I'm changing the soil. I literally, I'm like, you know, doing yeah. earthworks and changing the, now the soil is like this. Now you're a cucumber. Now you're lettuce. Now you're beans. Yeah. So yeah, you do have a lot of uh, options like that. It's just an advantage. Um, yeah, but I don't think it's a lot of work. Like growing in my containers is not much more work than growing in my garden beds. The only thing I would do more often would be probably watering. Wow. Um, but I do, I mean, I love having all these plants on my back deck. You know, I love walking out there and there's like a, a big planter full of all these herbs and micro tomatoes. Um, you know, there's peppers and pansies planted together. There's nasturtiums, there's edible flowers. So I, I love having that on my deck as an outdoor living space. So if I'm yeah. going to plant containers on my deck anyway for color and interest, why not make half the plants edible? Yeah, absolutely. Well, speaking of that, um, the speaking of things being easy or hard, I mean, perennials are one of the best things to grow if you don't want to have to keep reinventing the wheel every year. You just watch the plant get more awesome every year. So um, <laughs> are there any perennials that are particularly well suited to container gardening and, uh, and uh, any, any considerations one might, might, might need to consider if they're going to grow a perennial? Um, I, mean, it's, it'll, I mean, you've got different categories like herbs, of course, I suppose but yeah. also fruit bearing things. Um, yeah, can, can they overwinter the same way? Like when you've got a plant in the ground, the ground is, is got a level of insulation. It's insulated by the adjacent soil and it, it gets warmer yeah. the deeper you go. It's, it's a stable heat. Whereas the pod is above ground, it's, it's gonna get as cold as the air. The pot's gonna, if it's minus 20, the pot's gonna be minus 20. Whereas yeah. if you've got a plant that's in the ground, it's the air is minus 20, but the soil might be minus 10 or minus five or something like that. So uh, yeah. what considerations uh, do you have to think about when you're doing that? Well, I think if you're gonna grow perennial edibles um, in containers, you know, we're zone 5B, for example, right? So I would be looking at things that are even hardier than that. Like I wouldn't be trying to overwinter zone five or six plants necessarily in containers. I'd be trying to winter over zone four. So in three uh, plants in containers, cause they're gonna be hardier. Uh, and that is what I do. <laughs> So I do overwinter my alpine strawberries and window boxes and I put them in uh, my greenhouse or my garden shed for winter and I cover them with straw mulch, um, mm. you know, or old row covers just as an extra insulation layer on top. And then they sit there all winter long. I bring them out, you know, in early, early spring and kind of wake them up with some watering and, and, uh, and light again and they pop up. And that's, I've been doing that for many years. I overwinter mint in containers. And I mean, really, let's be honest, mint should only be grown in containers because it's yeah. invasive. So that's a great one to overwinter in containers, as well as lemon balm too. Any of those really, really hardy, uh, invasive perennials tend to do really well in containers. Um, yeah. But you know, if you have something in a container like mint and you've had it in a pot for you know a year or two, chances are you're probably gonna have to you know, take it apart, divide it, you know, put them into new containers, fresh soil. So you'll have to freshen up the soil. You'll either have to put it in a bigger pot or divide it up so that you can kind of refresh it like you would a house plant that's always grown this pot. Um, so that's a consideration when growing perennials in containers too. Um, but I find things like strawberries do really well. A lot of the perennial herbs do really well um, and certain perennial vegetables too. Uh, I do have artichokes in my greenhouse hmm. and they overwinter for me. So I grow them in my raised beds from seeds every year. And I grow them in my greenhouse that I've overwintered every year under a nice two foot deep pile of mulch over winter. Um, hmm. And those plants I'm now picking from. They're already producing chokes. Whereas the uh, ones in the garden won't produce probably for another six or eight weeks. So wow. they'll be later in the summer. Wow. Um, so you can play around a little bit in your garden as well. Um, you know, overwintering things that maybe aren't as hardy here, but I wouldn't do that in containers. I would really only do that um, in, in garden beds. But another way to get around the whole, how do you overwinter in containers? If it's not a huge container, like, you know, just a regular size container, you could sink it into a garden bed or a compost pile or mulch or something it, like leaves in the fall. Um, and that'll act as the in-ground insulation around the pot so that it'll, yes. it'll overwinter for you. Yeah, that makes a lot yeah. of sense. Yeah, that's that's the other option, I guess. Yeah, yeah that works. <laughs> right on, well, I, I, I don't know if there's anything else. Uh, I think we beat it to death. I think we got, <laughs> uh, I think we got everything, uh, everything. Um, I, I just had a coworker, she's gonna finally, you know, plant some tomatoes in her deck. And she was asking me, nice. you know, what can you, tell me about growing things in process and I'm going to have Nikki Jabbar on my show. She's going to tell you everything. Just, just wait a week sort of thing. You know? Everything and more that you didn't want to know. So lots of great info. <laughs> I think it's also a great, uh, a great way for a novice gardener to, I mean, it can be overwhelming, um, especially there's so much conflicting information out there uh, for how to yeah. start gardening. 
Um, so just get a couple pots and stick some soil in it and stick a plant you like to eat in there. And, and you know, that, that's, that could be the beginning of a uh, It's a, a great lifelong... way to get started. You're totally yeah. right. And, it, you know, for totally novice gardeners, herbs, I mean, you know how easy herbs are to grow. So many herbs grow very, very well and easily in containers. Yeah. Greek oregano, you know, thyme, basil, parsley, chives, they do really well in containers. They're hardly any work. Start there if you're totally new to gardening. Yeah, yeah. And they're, you're going to use, I mean, grow the one. It's funny, people will buy herbs that they would never cook with. <laughs> yeah. you know, I don't understand that. It's like, well, yeah. you know, which, which ones do you use in your cooking? Grow that one. Find, you know, make sure they'll survive in the zone. Um, yeah. But grow that herb. And then, then you know, because why would you grow something like, uh, I grow sage. Um, mm -hmm. And the first two years, I didn't know what to do with it because I never grew up using sage for anything. I had to learn how to, because the sage becomes this bush, this enormous it's beautiful, plant, you know, pollinator yeah. friendly too. But yeah, yeah you're yeah. right. <laughs> so I was like, what am I going to do with totally. all this damn sage, right? And now I, what yeah. I tended to, because I have too much of it, so much of it, uh, what I'll do is I throw it in the water when I'm boiling pasta. Oh, that's a good idea. Flavor goes in the noodle, it's sort of like an infusion sort of thing, right? So it just makes try the that. noodle a little bit more zippy, you know. Um, yeah. And then if you use some of the pasta water in the pasta sauce, you've got that sage essence. That's a good idea. I yeah. like that. That's a really good idea. I'll do that. I like a lot of the lemon herbs, like lemongrass, lemon balm, lemon verbena. And I use them yeah. for tea all the time because they're so yeah, delicious. Yeah. It's so easy to take a couple leaves of mint, a couple leaves of lemon verbena, make a little pot of delicious herbal tea. So easy. Man, yeah, no, so that's a great, you know, beginners, maybe try the herbs and then work yeah. your way up to the <laughs> tomatoes and so, sort of thing like that. So uh, anyway, Nikki, okay. it's, <laughs> it's great having you with us to talk about uh, planting in pots, growing vegetables in pots, and uh, hopefully we'll have you back again sometime. Yeah, I and, appreciate it. Thank you very much. This has been yeah. so much fun. Yeah, no, great. So uh, thanks for coming on the show. Everybody out there, until next time, get out there, get at it, have fun in your garden. Thanks for watching. Thanks, Nikki. Thanks. I really appreciate it. That was fun. <laughs> Take care. Hey, folks, if you want to help support my podcast and my YouTube channel, check out my sponsors, Vessi Seeds and Safer's Gardening Products. Uh, for Vessi's, go to their website, Vessi's.com. Use my coupon code GAVS21, and you'll get free shipping as long as there's a pack of seeds in your order and you don't have an oversized item uh, in your order. Just check out the description. The, de the details are in the description box of this video. Uh, if you want to buy stuff from uh, Safer's Gardening Products, you can buy all the things I use from Vessi Seeds and you'll get free shipping that way. They, they, they sell BTK, uh, Slug and Snail Killer, and end all that I use. Just check out the tools and accessories uh, link on their website. Uh, but you can also, if you're in Canada, you, you can buy uh, Safer's Gardening Products from woodstreambrands.ca. Um, if you have an order over $69, you'll get free shipping on that. They got a wide range of products goes well beyond the three things I use. I just, I only buy things for the problems I have, right? So I don't, but they've got all kinds of, pro, uh, you know, products for beetles and things like that. If you're in the U.S., go to saferbrand.com and buy your stuff there. That's the U.S., you know, if you're in U.S., buy from that uh, website, order online. They offer free shipping on all orders over $45. I assume that's $45 U.S., so yeah. If you want to help support the channel and the podcast, and they sell something you need, buy it from them. That'll help support everything I'm doing here. Thanks a lot. <laughs>